as I light the chalice here in my home, I invite you to light your chalice. Thresholds by Arlene Goff. Each threshold we cross offers an opportunity for change, for renewal, and for transformation from what we were and what we are to what we can be. How will we be renewed in this moment? How will we be changed in this hour? How will we be transformed through this gathering? Come, let come all who desire community. Come, let us be together. In this service, we come together to light a candle of sorrow, to recognize the fatigue, the anxiety, the moments when we're tired of the uncertainty. And Lily Roberts has an, asked me to mention her sister, Karen, who started chemo this week. She wanted her sister's name mentioned in this space with you, in the presence of this community for her healing. Sorrows in our lives continue even now. And I light the candle of joy for the moments of discovery, which also exist right now, and creativity and the kindness that we witness, witness the celebrations that do continue in our lives right now. Okay. I will get this candle of joy before we go on. <laughs> or maybe I'll get it later. You have to imagine the candle of joy is going strong. It's good. And someone does need to might um, mute themselves. So do remember to check and see if you are muted. I invite you into a time of prayer and meditation. Who are you thinking about on this Memorial Day weekend? A person who served our country, who comes to mind? Someone who perhaps was in active duty, maybe a chaplain, someone who served in the hospital, caring for those who fought in wars, the nurses, or worked in the veterans hospitals, or those who offered themselves as conscientious objectors and who gave their service in other ways. Remember them and invite them into our time right now. Remember their names remember their faces. This prayer by Barbara Peskin. Spirit of life, whom we have called by many names, in thanksgiving and in anguish. Bless the poets and those who mourn. Send peace for the soldiers who did not make the wars, but whose lives were consumed by them. Let strong trees grow above graves far from home, breathe through the arms of their branches. The earth will swallow your tears while the dead sing. No more, never again, remember me. For the wounded ones and those who received them back, let there be someone ready when <clears throat> memories come when the scars pull and the buried metal moves, and forgiveness for those of us who were not there, for our ignorance. And in us, veterans in a forest of a thousand fallen promises, let new leaves of protest grow on our stumps. 
give us courage to answer the cry of human pain and with our bare hands, our full hearts, with all of our intelligence, let us create the peace. Let us create the peace. And it is at this time that I invite you to enter the names of those you wish to remember in the chat. And so we remember John William Sachs, Gerald Dornbus, Avalina Porter Blocker, Gerald Pickett, John Kelly Sr. For Dennis Fries, conscientious objector and pacifist, he is missed. For Don Newformer, Dorothy Sachs Keldson. For Ken Dornbus, for Brian and Ward. For Grandma Betty, David McKean, Jack McKean, Benjamin Ziegler. For Richard Garrett Sachs. For Pat Moore Pickett's grandparents. Vlad Dupre, conscientious objector. Regis Bauer, Jr. and Sr. Olaf Freudstad. Dad Fru and Gary A. Richard. From Susan Jellema, my Uncle Bill, who was in the Dutch army and helped to liberate the prisoners in Dachau. From Jim Thomas, Mary Bell Moberly and her sons, James and Tommy. Joe and Dave Clutter, Sydney Cut Clutter and Alan Woodward. James Job. James Lee Job's father. Robert Daddle and William Daddle. Jocelyn Bradley. Ray Kopic. Bill Leibhart. And from Jill Pickett, the first doctor to die in Wuhan, who had been silenced for telling the truth about the virus. Naram Jackson. Dad Burt and Charlie Duane, Jr. Bob Muller, Lucen Burstein. Send peace for the soldiers and the conscientious objectors who did not make the wars, but whose lives were consumed by them. The earth will swallow our tears while the dead sing. No more, never again, remember me. And now we hold this space for just a few moments, remembering all of these lives that you have brought for us to remember. Amen. in gratefulness for those lives. I am doing online yoga now, like so many things these days. The other day, I was late for a class with my favorite teacher. I couldn't find the email link. I searched a few different ways. I looked in the trash and then in the spam. Then I thought to try the link from the same class the previous week. It worked and I got into the class on time. What I didn't do was get mad at myself for not registering, assume the yoga studio was an error, jump to blame or anger at anyone else I could think of, as well as myself. I think most of us have some version of this self-sabotage. I realized how much smarter, literally, and more content I can be if I apply that same focus and calm and acceptance to more of my life. Each moment becomes an opportunity to pause, 
to make choices that are consistent with my values and to be less reactive. I've come to think of these points in time as expansive threshold moments. I am ever so slowly getting better at them. Yoga is one practice that's helped me in this way. Yes, I'm stronger and more flexible and I have better posture, which my mother would have loved. But more significantly, I'm becoming more aware of how emotions manifest in my body. I can access tools like awareness and regulation of my breath to expand into an emotion like joy or quiet an emotion like anger. The heart is opened in many poses in yoga by expanding and relaxing the chest and shoulders, not in a puffed out way, but as if the heart is guiding you. The heart is regarded as a muscle that can be strengthened just like any other. Yoga practice often starts with the prayer. I practice yoga to love myself, to know the truth of who I am and for the benefits of all beings everywhere. Of course, we often think of threshold moments as starkly defined events, as turning points, like marriage or maybe skydiving. The phrase, and in that moment I realized, has become very popular. But I more often think of threshold moments as small choices and realizations as small as waiting a moment for a friend to find their words when they're struggling with the thought. These tiny moments prepare us to meet those larger and more dramatic thresholds with purpose and love. This morning, our images of thresholds started with places like doorways and the tunnel of a wave's curl the long arch of trees looking out of a window. And they're changed, they were changed to people in relationship to the threshold, the closed door waiting to be opened by, for a young girl and an elderly, elderly man leaving a dance hall, soldiers jumping out of the belly of a plane. And Emily spoke so beautifully of her experience in yoga as a threshold. Our Sunday worship team, when we continued to talk about thresholds, well, it became a little more subtle yet. The first day of school when you're five years old, a clay pot and a new plant, poised and ready to be potted, an empty house and the truck full of chairs, a bed frame and pans. The threshold moment of being given the gift one person said of a gun by a parent as a sign of being grown up and trusted to be responsible. The threshold of becoming pregnant. The first time a parent lets go of the bike and the child pedals away, no training wheels, legs pumping and free. And the crack beginning in the shell of a bird's egg. Thresholds can be large or small, places or experiences, anything that signifies a border between two worlds. In folk tales, the threshold of a story is at the edge of the field of whispering grain and you can still see the homes of the village from this place and the demarcation of the forest where mystery moves through the shadows. That's a threshold. And ancient religions imagined the threshold of being ferried across a river, a threshold dividing the world of the living from the land of the dead. And in fiction, the Lord of the Rings, there's a hole in the earth, a doorway that takes Bilbo Baggins into an underground cavern. And this is where Bilbo finds the magic ring that gives him his destiny to overcome a great force of evil Thresholds in literature can be a magic entrance in the back of a closet opening to another world where the reader identifies with the characters of children who 
travel and discover magical abilities in the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. What is beyond the thresholds is an unknown experience and maybe even wisdom, but certainly what we cannot know and cannot imagine, and there is no turning back. And as important as the threshold is for life, our interest and the story's interest so often on what's happening on the other side of that threshold. But it is always, always this gateway that allows what will unfold to happen. In that moment of crossing over, passing through, we are in an unknown land, experiencing a moment of unknowing and uncertainty. And sometimes, often, I think we rush. The photographers who captured the images of the doorways and the natural arches saw the magic and sacred beauty. And Emily identified that sacred beauty in her yoga practice. Consciously, we may think nothing of a doorway or a moment of change, but the brain registers its presence. And there's a call to wake up or pause because there's potential danger. Lingering in this place, no matter how difficult, however, is one of the very best things that we could do. My uncle, his name was Wallace, was an inspiration for me and you may have heard about him before because of his love of music and the arts and teaching students. His students were those who did not have financial resources to attend the music conservatory and he dedicated his life to them. Most often he was dressed very formally with a bow tie. He was a very imposing character, but he had a really soft heart. His photo is on my desk at church and it was taken by my nephew, who's an amazing portrait photographer. Wallace developed Parkinson's disease in his elder years and my nephew decided that the best photo would be an out of focus portrait of his great uncle. It was a way to interpret the disease. Now this was a very artistic project, but it didn't sit very well with Wallace, who was hoping for a much more flattering and upbeat image. I loved Wallace's humor and the way he was able to allow himself to be seen and remembered, even though it wasn't his favorite way of being known. Parkinson's has many symptoms, and one of the ways Parkinson's affected Wallace was how sometimes he would freeze when he'd come to the threshold of doorways. Apparently, a situation when the brain registers an alert for the presence of a change. It was recommended that he exercise by the doctor, but he didn't. There were many, many recommendations that he didn't pursue. He took medication, but this didn't alleviate the particular problem of his body freezing when he came to thresholds. But two things helped. One was to actually stop moving, to consciously stop moving for a minute. Pausing was what actually, well, was what the doctor recommended, the one thing that Uncle Wallace followed for advice. When his walking froze, he wouldn't try to push through it. He'd just stand in the doorway and look around as if it was the most interesting place to be. An amazing view to behold. He didn't start this way. He started to be embarrassed, but he grew into this new way of pausing at the threshold. It was not always convenient for him or for others who were walking behind him, but really there was no choice. If he tried to push his body, his body would defy his mind and there was a good chance that he'd fall. When he paused in the doorway, he felt as if everything came into alignment again. His whole body caught up with where his mind had intended that he go. There was one more thing that helped, and he discovered this himself. If he would take the hand of someone beside him, preferably someone he knew, but it could be a stranger, just a touch was all he needed. And he'd quietly say, a touch please. 
And those who went to events with him as he continued his many, many activities learned that sometimes approaching or moving through a threshold could be difficult for him. It could be a moment of embarrassment or even danger. And we learn to be close, but not too close, and casually take his hand or wait to hear, a touch, please. And then we'd both pause in the doorway as if conversing or to look at something on the door frame. And it turns out it was a wonderful spot to stop. He learned, and we all learned, the power of caring connections. When there's no judgment about the importance of both crossing through to the other side on your own or moving through the transitions with the help of another. The Reverend Sarah Lawal is one of the ministers who regularly contributes to Soul Matters, which is where we use, we use that as a touchstone for all of our topics. And she wrote, a threshold is a space to imagine a new way and a new self. For Wallace, the new way and the new self was the realization that he couldn't always be independent, and that was a loss. And he went through all the feelings of loss. But he also realized that he was the recipient of a love he had not imagined. As soon as that fiercely independent person understood the depth of relationships that surrounded him, once that was understood, nothing was the same. He knew the love of his family and his long earned legacy of teaching students who could not afford those music lessons at a great music conservatory. He was known and he knew this value in his own being. Here's how the writer Gary Zukov put it. At the moment of realization that a threshold is crossed, what seems unthinkable becomes thinkable. Once that realization has emerged, you can either honor it or ignore it, but you cannot forget it. What has become known can not become unknown again. Thresholds are all around us. They give form to the transitions of who we are in this moment and who we will become. Lingering in a place of transition is awkward, often awkward. It's uncomfortable. People see us and we see ourselves as not yet in action, not yet involved in the next adventure of our day, of our life, and we're probably off balance. It's the moment when our being at some level knows that it's time to be awake and alert for change. It's time to stop and to look around. As a congregation, stop and look around. On this screen, look at the people who are with you. We love our building and we love our grounds. And I'm here to remind you that the essential church is open right here with you. In programs and outreach and opportunities for caring, everything is happening. It's just the building that's closed for now, for longer than we imagined. There are internal alert alarms going off in my mind these days and I know just about everyone I talk to has the same thing happening for them. But stop and look around. In this time of grief and anxiety and unpredictable change, and it's all of this, we're changing and expanding how we can be together, how we can help each other. So find the equivalent of reaching for friends and strangers alike. We will be remembered and we will remember ourselves by how we live on the threshold. Just a touch, please. And to that I say, amen.